<clears throat> okay, good afternoon. Uh, I have uh, a very nice announcement to inform you and those who are uh, <clears throat> listening and watching. Uh, we had to do a little switching of the last two sessions of Demystifying Medicine. So on May 1st, uh, we're going to have a, a round table kind of <clears throat> discussion with uh, Michael Gottesman, uh, Jonathan Udall, and several others who've been involved in the question of uh, what do you do after you finish your postdoc at the NIH? And on the last day, on May 8th, uh, Francis Collins, the director of the NIH, is going to speak on the topic of the National Institutes of Hope. And uh, Francis tells me he's going to present some of his views about uh, the world in which we live and uh, uh, where science is standing. So I'm sure that will be a very exciting event. Is there anyone in the room who doesn't know what this picture is? Don't hesitate. You all know, right? So how about you, sir? Do you know what it is? Right, okay. So that's the Brooklyn Bridge. And <clears throat> we show this each time for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, the picture was taken by my grandfather. But secondly, it symbolizes what the whole purpose of the demystifying medicine course is. Uh, once you build the bridge, life is never the same on either side. The people in Brooklyn, the far shore here, had no idea of what was gonna happen to that farming community when the bridge was built. And the people in New York on the proximal side thought they were gonna be invaded by a bunch of foreigners and farmers. Well, times didn't prove that out. But we are like the two gentlemen on the catwalk, sort of trying to bridge some of the amazing advances in uh, modern contemporary biological and engineering sciences uh, with human health and, and disease. And I would point out that the usual way in which this has involved in uh, in medicine is that uh, people describe a disease, uh, maybe they look at the pathology, they give it a name, and then that's a stimulus for more reductionist uh, studies to try and understand mechanisms in treatment. But I call your attention to the fact that we're living in a world where that bridge is changing. And today is an example of that kind of bridge, in a way, you know, what I'm referring to is the fact that when you start to think about risk factors for people who seem to be healthy, or prognostic things, detectors, markers, and you look at this using sophistication of genomic analysis and other forms of such analysis, in a way, you're putting the cart before the horse compared to what the traditional pathways of medicine have been. So I thought that was an interesting uh, point. Now, please. This is an example, today's uh, discussion is an example of uh, uh, the former, the traditional way. Uh, Charcot is considered to be the father of clinical neurology. Uh, if you have time and want to read incredible things, you can read the French or the English translation of his description of patients who had diseases that, uh, you know, were totally unknown. And one of them is a description of a group of patients, a small group, uh, that had uh, motor neuron uh, disease that was progressive and fatal. That was in 1869, and the disease was called Charcot's sickness, or the maladie de Charcot, and it sort of sat that way 
for a long, long time, with the exception of some pathology that was done along the line, but not much attention was paid to it until an American hero, uh, Lou Gehrig, uh, baseball's Iron Man. Um, he was a wonderful person. I remember seeing him often with my father when he played. Uh, Gehrig played, not my father, for the New York Yankees. And he was the Iron Man because he had the longest record for consecutive uh, playing. And his batting average was in the 300s all the time. And then on one year, it began to fall. And things began to happen. And it happened very quickly. And he gave a very famous speech at uh, uh, Yankee Stadium, saying he had the best life in the world. But within two years, he had died of ALS. The disease was named after him, and more people knew it as Lou Gehrig's disease rather than the anatomic designation. And thereafter, suddenly this became recognized widely, globally. And there was great public pressure because of the severity of the disease to find answers. And that's kind of where we are. The era of genomics, molecular biology, uh, where do things stand? Now, here's Gehrig on the left. Uh, he was the number three batter. The number four was Babe Ruth, probably the most famous figure in baseball history, the home run hitter. And they were great friends. Now, I show this picture because Gehrig died at the age of 31, having suffered from ALS for approximately two years. On your right is Stephen Hawkins, uh, who was, until almost three weeks ago, uh, uh, a professor of theoretical uh, uh, physics at uh, the University of Cambridge, occupied the chair first established by Sir Isaac Newton. Now, Hawkins, also, his story is different. Uh, he developed the disease about 50 years before he died. And for that next 50 years, his pathway was very different from that of Lou Gehrig's. And one of the things one wants to think about is why, how. So what have we learned about this? Is ALS like an iceberg? Or did Charcot, the clinical picture that he described, is that it? Or with the new knowledge, has the clinical spectrum now broadened? So the symptoms, the signs, and maybe even the pathology have changed. Is that happening? And what can be done to diagnose, to treat, to prevent? And so we're very fortunate in having two globally known experts here at the NIH who are going to talk to us about this. And the first speaker is Mary Kay Floater, who uh, got her MD and PhD at the University of California, at, at Washington University in St. Louis, and then did residency training in neurology uh, and a postdoc in physiology at UCSF in California. Uh, she came to the NIH and progressively established her research career in. 2006, she was appointed the NINDS Deputy Clinical Director and became a senior clinician in 2008. Her research focuses on rare motor neuron disorders, one of which is the topic of today's presentations. And the second speaker is Brian Trainer, uh, who received his uh, MD degree and PhD from University College in Dublin, Ireland. And he trained in neurology at MIT and at Harvard. Uh, he was a staff neurologist at the Mass General Hospital and came in 2005 to the NIH as a clinical associate. Uh, he's a senior investigator in the laboratory of neurogenetics 
And one of the prime movers, if you read some of the papers that have been posted uh, that he submitted uh, in the genetic analysis of ALS. So we're very grateful to both of you for being willing to come and educate us. Very good. Can you hear me if I uh, speak through this microphone? Great. So as Dr. Arias uh, mentioned, uh, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis um, is also known as Lou Gehrig's disease in the United States. Um, and in the UK, it's called motor neuron disease. And that's a little bit confusing because in the US, we sometimes use the term motor neuron disease to refer to a whole family of disorders of which ALS is only one. Uh, so I've been asked to talk about uh, what, what the patients are like and to put a human face on the patients. So my talk is really going to be mostly um, about the stories of a couple of the patients, uh, but just bear with me. I do have a few slides just to put us all um, on the same plate. So uh, as mentioned, Charcot first described ALS, and he described it knowing patients and knowing their clinical exam and then looking at the pathology. And so what ALS consists of is degeneration of two sets of neurons. Clinically, he noticed that the patients had wasting of muscles. That's called amyotrophy. And that's due to the degeneration, let me see if this pointer works, of the spinal motor neurons that actually correct, connect directly to the muscles and the motor neurons in the brainstem that connect to muscles as well. So these would be the muscles of the face and the tongue up in the brainstem, the arms and the legs in the uh, spinal cord. Uh, he noticed that in the ventral horn of the spinal cord, there, those large motor neurons were gone. And he also noticed that there was scarring or sclerosis in the lateral part of the spinal cord where the axons run from the neurons in the, cortical, in the motor cortex uh, that travel down the cortical spinal tract to provide information to the spinal motor neurons. So clinicians sometimes refer to these as upper motor neurons, although they don't directly connect to muscle and lower motor neurons, the ones that do connect directly to muscle. Depending on where the disease begins, which particular uh, sets of neurons are first affected, uh, patients will develop weakness of their volitional movements. And if it's uh, involving uh, the nerve cells of the brainstem, those will be problems with speaking, swallowing, uh, and um, moving their tongue around. Uh, if they develop in the cervical cord, it could be a problem uh, in movements and wasting in uh, muscles of the arms, as well as the diaphragm, which is an important muscle for respiration. And if it's in the, the lower part, the lumbar part of the spinal cord, it will affect the legs. So, um, let's see, do I have to point this anywhere? Uh, so an interesting... Um, clinical phenomenon on patients with ALS is that it seems to begin almost simultaneously in both the lower motor neurons and the upper motor neurons. And uh, a number of years ago, uh, a clinician, John Rabbits in Seattle, uh, described uh, patients that he had followed over years and um, showed that uh, the, the clinical uh, progression of symptoms seemed to suggest that ALS was a disease where there was spreading. So if the hand muscles were affected, which would suggest the cervical cord, at the same time, they would develop some clinical signs suggesting that the upper motor neurons were also affected to the arm. And over time, the other arm might become affected. Eventually, it would spread up and down the leg to different segments. And so the ALS is a disease which affects adults. They usually um, are in their 50s to 60s, but it's uh, got a variable onset, uh, some patients as young as 30 and some patients as old as 80. Uh, typically, uh, patients who develop ALS will have an average survival of just only about three to four years, but there is a big spread, including patients uh, such as Stephen Hawking, who spent the last, I believe, uh, 20 years of his life on a mechanical ventilator because his respiratory muscles were not able to actually uh, work. So. Um, ALS is a clinical is diagnosed by clinical symptoms, um, strong way. And so what I want to do next is to show you, if you were to come to the clinic, what we would be looking for in a patient to say, 
Does this patient have a clinical problem suggestive of lower motor neuron dysfunction and upper motor neuron dysfunction? And I see Phoebe here, our nurse from the fifth floor clinic. She recognizes this. This is where you would check in if you came to see, uh, see us in neurology. Okay, so the first thing is that the patients who have had, uh, it's where the motor neurons die that connect to muscles, the muscles begin to atrophy. This is amyotrophy. If the muscles are affected, uh, the muscles uh, that atrophy are in, oops, excuse me, uh, in the uh, cervical cord, you may see some loss of muscle around the shoulder girdle. You can see here the hollowing. If it's uh, this lower cervical segment, you can see the intrinsic hand muscles will uh, atrophy. So you notice here, for example, the muscle that moves the index finger, it looks pretty good on this hand and it's really totally wasted on the other hand. This is one of our patients uh, and it's very asymmetric. This hand seems to be in good uh, strength. Those motor neurons are still fairly healthy. And over here, you can see that this hand has started to lose the muscles that move the thumb as well as the intrinsic muscles of the finger. So the one of the things we look for is whether patients have weakness and atrophy. Now, as the, um, you know, I'm, this is my um, first time using um, iMovie to make movies, so I hope this works. Uh, so as the motor neurons begin to die, uh, they become hyper excitable. And while they're still connected to the muscle fibers, uh, begin to see these uh, fasciculations. And so I know that many of you probably have had a twitch of a muscle here or there, but if you focus your attention on the uh, upper part of the shoulder girdle, you'll see that the motor, uh, the muscle has all these twitches and these are called fasciculations. We consider these to be a sign of lower motor neuron dysfunction. Now, if I had a, um, a needle and I put it uh, into the muscle and it was connected to an amplifier, the muscle fibers, the individual muscle fibers that no longer are getting nerve input would begin to give off a lot of spontaneous action potentials and those are called fibrillations. So these are the kinds of things with this uh, EMG, electromyography, and clinical exam that we use to say that there's involvement of the lower motor neurons. Okay. Um, the, what I've showed you there was involving the limbs, but there's also um, atrophy that can occur in the tongue muscles. And you can see in this patient here uh, that uh, he has, uh, let's see if I can play that again. Um, he has fasciculations uh, in the tongue. And uh, he also, when I look to uh, his gag reflex, see Brian never tests a gag, gag uh, it's very brisk. So this is a combination of the brisk reflexes of an upper motor neuron dysfunction and his tongue is wasting away. So this is a patient where we can see the clinical signs of both sets of neurons being affected. Now, what are uh, upper motor neuron signs that we might see in a, um, in a limb? And here uh, I'm going to show you some examples of hyperactive reflexes. So here's a gentleman, as I tap his biceps tendon, you'll see that it jerks two times instead of one time. When there's repeated um, uh, jerks, that's called clonus. I tap the triceps reflex and you'll see that the, the tip of the thumb is actually wiggling. So there's hyper excitability of the input uh, to, this, to the uh, motor neurons. Similarly in the legs, um, oh my gosh, I thought these, uh, these were too long, these videos. I can play this again. here. So here's the uh, showing that the reflexes are hyper excitable, they spread. And uh, this is true in the legs, I tap the right leg and the left leg um, jerks as well. And then there's a return of pathological signs that you see in infants before the corticospinal tract goes, the fanning of the toes and the rising of the big toe, which is the Babinski sign. So when I see a patient in the clinic, I'm doing the exam and I'm trying to look in all the different segments of the body if there is evidence for, clinical evidence for um, dysfunction of both upper and lower motor neurons. Okay, um, so now um, I've showed you what I would look for in the clinic. I'd like to tell you the stories of a couple of patients. Um, and I just wanna make a little disclaimer here that these videos were not made for presentation or for production. Uh, when we see a patient in the clinic, we oftentimes uh, will we'll take videotapes of certain actions so we can make measurements later. 
And as a part of this, my postbacs and I, we will um, try to elicit a little bit of spontaneous speech just to see if their speech is okay. And in the process of doing that, we oftentimes will ask them questions which give us an insight into their memory or whether they're able to um, uh, understand the kinds of things that we're asking. Um, so this first patient here is a gentleman that I first saw in 2004. Uh, and he was sent to me by a neurologist down uh, at um, Georgetown because he'd had about two years of his, le uh, his right leg uh, becoming progressively stiff. And uh, he hadn't developed any lower motor neuron signs. And they sent him to me wondering if he had a variant of ALS called primary lateral sclerosis in which the neurons of the brain degenerate, but not the ones in the spinal cord. And uh, at that point, we really uh, didn't have a good test to distinguish between these two disorders, except to let enough time go by to know that it's not likely to be ALS. So I asked him to come back a year later. So uh, this is a video of him walking at three years. And you can see that as he is walking, that his right leg is stiff. The reflexes were very brisk, but there were no evidence of any uh, lower motor neuron signs. And so at that point, I said, well, it could be that you, in fact, do have primary lateral sclerosis. Um, and uh, we'll see you in a year and still see if that's still the case. Now, here's uh, the video of the conversational speech that we recorded. And I think it's... And, uh, tell me about this person who came with you today. This is my son, Michael. He's my, uh, I have three sons, but this is Michael. He's, uh, he lives near me. He's a good guy. He's a good guy? That's good to know. How have things uh, been changing with you over the past year? Well, for the most part, I've been, I feel I'm weaker. I'm falling more and um, more off balance and not responding to any kind of, uh, you know, sort of water therapy and so forth. Mm -hmm. yeah, like I feel I should be doing. Mm -hmm. Generally weaker. Generally weaker. Um, how's your thinking? Any problems? I think it's okay. All right. Memory's okay? I think so, yes. Okay, good. Okay, so you can see from this uh, discussion here that he's very engaged with us. His speech is unaffected. And uh, he himself says that he thinks his memory is fine. And the main problem now is the balance and the problem with his walking. Uh, when I asked him to come back a year later, he said, well, I'm, I'm remodeling my house. I can't come. And I said, okay, well, just let us know as soon as you can come. So then uh, he came back not quite two years later, and uh, this is how he appeared at that time. I enlisted in the Navy and went through flight training, got my commission, and spent 31 years. I flew helicopters throughout the only tour, and I ended up in uh, the Pentagon. And my last job was as the Inspector General for the Chief of Naval Personnel. So I got to travel around solving people's problems. Okay, so the first thing that you're going to notice uh, is that, first of all, he's holding his head forward because the muscles that extend the neck are so weak. This is a very characteristic sign in ALS. And you can sort of get a sense he's actually wearing the same shirt. Uh, that he's lost a lot of muscle bulk, uh, particularly in the upper part of his arms. Uh, he's talking here, and he's still, he's a little bit slower, but he's still very clear in what he's saying. And I cut it off because right after this point, uh, he, we said, well, where have you been stationed in your career? And he was able to name off about 20 places. So at this time, I was doing a study to look for whether there were cognitive changes in ALS patients and CLS patients, and to see how frequently uh, these patients had cognitive impairment. This was quite a, um, an issue in the early 2000s. And so we did full cognitive testing with our neuropsychologist, and he had no problems with his thinking or memory. Um, we saw him again one year later, and I will just show you this last video, and I want to apologize because it's very shaky, but I think uh, it is um, uh, very instructive. Okay. Can you tell me your name? Yes. Would you tell me your name? Sure. My name is... <laughs> Looking for what is your name? 
What is your name? Okay. So um, I just wanted to pause that there because he's teasing me about my interviewing technique that I shouldn't say, can you tell me your name, but what is your name is the proper way to ask that question. Uh, but one thing that you can see is that he's really had a lot of uh, deterioration in that one year. Uh, the muscles on his hands, they're quite wasted away, the upper arms as well, and he has to use this little joystick to move his uh, chair up and down. The neck muscles are so weak that he now needs to use a, a brace to hold his head upright. Okay, I'm just going to continue this because, interestingly, uh, he still has a good sense of humor and his personality comes through. And um, what's the date today? I have no idea. It's probably the 23rd or so Wednesday of April. And what year is it? 2008. Okay. And uh, have you ever seen me before? Yes. Um, where have you seen me before? Uh, here. So tell me a little bit about your six grandchildren. Actually, I have eight. Eight grandchildren. Six in Colorado and six here. Hmm. The oldest is 15, and the youngest now is about nine. 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 11, 10, Okay, so cognitively, I mean, if you can remember the ages of your eight grandchildren on some random day when you're this ill, uh, you can see that uh, it's pretty, he's probably got fairly good cognition. Uh, something else you might have noticed is that he's able to move his eyes normally. The extraocular muscles generally are unaffected in ALS until probably as late as uh, 20 years into the disease uh, if you manage to survive that long. Uh, so this is a gentleman who would fit uh, the classic ALS that most people know. Now, he has a couple risk factors here. So he mentioned that he was in the military. And so we don't know why, but we do know that uh, being in the military, whether you're in combat or not, does slightly increase the risk for ALS. Um, he also played sports in uh, uh, high school and college, maybe, I'm, I'm not sure which ones, but he played football. And so contact sports is something that Epidemiologically, there is a little bit of association with increased risk for ALS, and now we kind of wonder if it has something to do with um, small head injuries, but that, that part of it is really not yet clear. Now, he did not have any family history of ALS, uh, but interestingly, his mother had died in her 80s of dementia, and that will perhaps mean something as we talk about the next case. And uh, he had said that Huntington's disease ran on his father's side of the family, but there was no one in his generation with Huntington's disease. Okay. So does anybody have any questions about this at this point? Um, yeah. So is it always asymmetric that one part of the body is affected and not the other? It often will begin on one side. Of course, when it's bulbar involving the tongue, of course, it's midline. Uh, but it generally uh, generalizes. Um, and also, it starts with the motor neuron. Does it also uh, it indicate that affect the sensory neurons? And to what extent? So the sensory neurons are generally unaffected. If we do something like a nerve conduction study and we measure the amplitude of the sensory nerve response, or if we uh, you know test by um, you know, pinprick or, or vibration sensitivity, they're generally unaffected. People have reported some very slight uh, uh, sensory abnormalities, but they're very subtle and they don't typically uh, have a clinical, um, they're not clinically recognized by the patient. Uh, and we know that pathologically, there is a little bit of spread of some of the pathology to the postcentral gyrus. Are they doing any studies? So this gentleman uh, back in uh, you know that time, the only gene that had been discovered for ALS was SOD1, and he did not have that. Yeah. In this gentleman, uh, I don't believe so. Uh, not that I am. Not that I elicited at that time. Yes. So why does he have? Why do you call this ALS rather than other neurologic diseases? The, the clinical sequence so specific that it warrants the, the, the diagnosis. 
Well, I think this comes down to the question of whether ALS is a single disease. Uh, so that we, uh, it is th this clinical picture, uh, typically uh, uh, the, that and the progression of the disease are what we use to say that it's ALS. Now, ALS occurs throughout the world, and uh, I know Brian's going to talk about the genes, and those don't, uh, those have different uh, uh, frequencies in different populations throughout the world. So it may be that there are multiple different ways that get you to this picture of the degeneration of the upper and lower motor neurons. Uh, also, it's the case that clinically what we see are things related to the upper and lower motor neurons, but there are probably uh, changes in interneurons as well, and uh, it's probably much more than just those two classes of neurons that are affected by the degeneration. Okay. Yes. So we don't have postmortem on this gentleman in particular, um, but uh, there. Um, this is a very interesting question, and maybe the second patient I can uh, show you something where I have actually. I think I have a little heat map of some pathology. Um, okay, so um, so uh, the sort of change from when I first saw that patient in the early 2000s uh, to now is that we kind of think of ALS as being somewhere on a spectrum of neurodegenerative disorders. And so the motor neuron, dis motor neuron disorder spectrum uh, really has come about with the recognition that um, there is clinical, pathological, and some genetic overlap between disorders that cause frontal temporal dementia and ALS. Um, and so you'll read different numbers for uh, the, the overlap of clinical changes. Uh, there was a very nice study by Kathy Lomanhurth at UCSF where she um, examined patients in Bruce Miller's frontotemporal dementia clinic and found that about a third of them, or I think actually 15% of them, might uh, meet criteria for ALS. But when you run a memory clinic, you're not actually looking at all of these aspects of motor function. Uh, Bruce Miller examined the patients in the ALS clinic, and about 15% of them uh, could meet criteria for frontotemporal dementia. And when they looked for, you know, what percentage of patients have some cognitive or motor impairment, you'll read numbers that go from anywhere from 15 to 50%. In our study, about a third of the ALS patients had some impairment of their cognition, and I think that's about where many of the numbers um, fall. Um, the second thing, in 2006, um, that kind of brought together ALS and frontotemporal dementia was uh, some pathology work by John Close Domanowski and Virginia Lee, where they were finally able to identify the ubiquinated inclusions that were in uh, neurons in ALS. And that was when they discovered that um, the protein that they had was the RNA binding protein, oops, sorry, uh, TDP43. Um, And um, it turns out that when they looked at um, uh, sporadic ALS and as well as the genetic uh, forms of ALS that were then known, that about 97% of the ALS patients have TDP43 as one of the um, misfolded proteins that's in the ubiquinated inclusions. And interestingly, uh, the two diseases that uh, they were able to look at that didn't have those were SOD1 and FUS. And I bring this up because SOD1 was the first gene that was described for ALS. And uh, for 20 years, all of the animal work has been on, on mice who have mutations in SOD1. But interestingly, there was at that time in frontotemporal dementia some ubiquinated inclusions that were unidentified. And they were able to show that they also had the same RNA binding protein. So um, the other uh, patients with frontotemporal dementia have um, uh, uh, inclusions of the protein tau, which is the same protein you see in Alzheimer's disease. Um, so pathologically, uh, there's something going on similar at the cellular level. But when they looked at the distribution, uh, the ALS patients have much more focal distribution of the pathology in the primary motor cortex and in the brainstem, a little bit that is over into the uh, postcentral gyrus, whereas the patients who had frontotemporal dementia, it was much more widespread throughout the cortex. I don't know if that answered your question. Um, and then the third piece of this clinical pathological is the genetics. 
Brian's going to talk about it, but interestingly, I'll just point out that some of the first mutations, gene mutations that cause ALS, uh, seem to cause a pretty pure ALS. And some of the first gene mutations that cause FTD, tau and progranulin, actually cause a pretty pure frontotemporal dementia. But a lot of the new genes that have been discovered in, uh, are in the middle where patients can have a mixture of cognitive and motor dysfunction. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the next patient who has a mutation in a gene C9ORF, which I know that Brian will spend a lit, bit more time on. Now those patients uh, have both uh, could have complete sporadic AL, or complete uh, classic ALS with no cognitive impairment. They could have a pure frontotemporal dementia or a mixture of the two. Um, so this next patient um, was in our study, and he has a mixture of the two. Uh, so let me tell you about this gentleman a little bit first. Um, he, he had been in good health up until, well, he, had, he still thought he was in good health, let me just say that. Um, he had been working, and I'll show you a little clip of his speech uh, when he was working uh, as a, um, a lobbyist for the auto industry. And he was abruptly fired at the age of 57. Not really clear what really happened there. Uh, but then he did get another job for about another six months or so. And when he was around the age of 59, his wife realized that he had uh, done some financial mismanagement and had somehow spent down all their retirement funds and that he had a personality change. He was more placid and he was less intense. He wasn't as high focused as he used to be. And he had some inappropriate behaviors, making uh, you know inappropriate remarks to a family friend at that time. Um, so we saw him uh, uh, when we, his first symptoms were about five years before we first saw him. And I just want to show you a little bit of what he was like before uh, he became ill, uh, because I want you to listen to the difference in his speech. So this is his um, uh, congressional testimony uh, before he had the illness. There are over 220 million vehicles registered in the United States. To repair and service these vehicles quickly and properly, we need a broad network of independent repair shops, aftermarket parts suppliers, and dealerships as partners. Okay, so he can talk pretty quickly. He's pretty smart. He's, you know, uh, doing very well. So here he is uh, when he first enrolled in our study in 2013. What did you like to do for fun in Michigan? Genealogy and skied. Okay. Okay. Um, do you have a uh, any interesting genealogy stories to share? <laughs> yeah, I'm related to the guy who signed the Declaration of Independence. Really? Oh, I actually didn't catch that. Um, is that why Dr. Turner had come to meet with you? Actually, he came to meet with me because of the kings and queens of England I'm related to. Oh, wow. So who all are you related to? Henry's and Louis. I don't know which ones. I can't remember which ones it is. Okay. Okay, so his speech is a little bit more slurred at this point, and he was having uh, some initial problems with his swallowing. Uh, I don't know if you picked it up, but uh, he's also got some stereotype uh, in, uh, movements that he's doing repetitively at that point. On his cognitive testing, uh, he had considerable cognitive impairment, and he met the criteria for frontotemporal dementia. Um, so we saw this gentleman, um, I think, four or five more times over the next several years. And what's kind of an interesting uh, uh, assay, I guess it would be, about his um, executive function, the cognitive function that it takes to do a sequence of actions, uh, is his wife's description of the cooking. So initially, um, because he had spent out all the money, he was uh, working at a very menial job at the, a local store, uh, but she would have him do the cooking. And uh, he could initially uh, do the cooking if she made a list of what to put in as the ingredients. And then uh, a few months later, uh, about 18 months later, he really wasn't able to do that, so everything had to be cooked in the crock pot. And then after that, uh, when we saw him in 2016, um, he uh, couldn't drive anymore. He had totaled the car. Uh, he was burning the food when he was cooking. So this is the kind of cognitive changes he was having. Memory is actually pretty good. This is different from Alzheimer's disease. He had pretty good memory at that time. Um, and so I'm going to show you the last time that we saw him in 2017. What types of things do you paint? 
an angel. What else have you painted? What kind of things do you enjoy? Watching TV. Oh, what do you like to watch on TV? This is a show. Okay, so the things that you notice is how slow he is to respond. Uh, I've act we've actually uh, edited out some pieces here because after two or three minutes, if he hasn't responded, we just go on to the next question. But he does eventually, you know, say, oh, I like to watch TV. I watch the Today Show. He has a lot more dysarthria, and he also exhibits something called forced yawning, which is uh, an interesting neurologic sign, which is considered to be an upper motor neuron sign of the brain of uh, the bulbar muscles. Um, and he has, again, as he had before, these sort of stereotyped little movements as well. Um, so this gentleman, um, you know, eventually uh, had gone to, uh, uh, and one other thing I should say is that uh, he had developed this funny habit of not completely swallowing his food. So he would take sips of uh, iced tea and would hold it in his mouth for hours and hours. I bring this up, I'm not actually 100% uh, sure about his final days, but in our, uh, one of our other patients, uh, this abil inability to uh, sequence the movements of swallowing had led to choking to death. And that turns out to be thought to be one of the more common causes of death in frontal temporal dementia patients that's unexplained. Um, so um, the last thing I would like, so this is an example of somebody who has frontal temporal dementia becoming very apathetic over time, but also developing some slight motor symptoms. He falls somewhere on that spectrum, maybe a little bit more to the FTD side, but a combination of ALS and FTD symptoms. So the last uh, video I want to show here um, is one that I have edited uh, from some YouTube videos, and I think the handout I gave the actual videos if anyone wants to watch the full thing. Many of us, uh, many of the people in the U.S. really first heard about ALS uh, in 2014 with the Ice Bucket Challenge. And the Ice Bucket Challenge uh, was started, uh, there's three young men who recently uh, were awarded the Humanitarian Award for the Ice Bucket Challenge, and the mother of them, uh, Nancy Frades, was the one who accepted it in December from the um, International ALS Foundation. The first uh, uh, person in, who started this, you'll see on the next bit in the video, uh, was a, a, a guy named Anthony. His wife um, was a sister of a professional golfer, and that golfer, Chris Kennedy, sent her a Facebook challenge uh, for Ice Bucket Challenge. Um, the uh, Pat Quinn, who was uh, another ALS patient in New York, uh, saw it, and he passed it on to his friend, Peter Frades, who was a baseball player in Boston. Peter Frades was friends with uh, some NFL players like Tom Brady, who then put it onto their Facebook page, and the next thing you know, it became a social media phenomenon. And it was a very successful fundraising campaign. It raised $115 million. Uh, when Nancy Freddy showed a video at uh, the um, December meeting at the International um, Symposium on ALS, I was very struck that the video showed you a lot of what a day in the life of a patient with ALS is. And that's why I decided to show uh, part of this video. And then I have uh, very poorly uh, edited on some bits from uh, a, uh, a, a news show uh, that showed uh, him towards uh, a more severe time of his life. And so this last video is about two minutes long. Started the end of ALS. Anthony has weakness in his upper body. He has no use of his hands anymore. We feed him through a tube. I have to have my brother, my father, or my wife shower me, get me dressed. There's a reason why Pete's not talking because he can no longer talk. He's in a chair because he can no longer walk. There are many different devices he has at this time because without them, he wouldn't be able to live. Your mind is not affected at all, and yet your body is just completely shutting down, and there's nothing you can do about it. Pete was a Division I baseball star. Can I give you a star? <laughs> 
Here we were, you know, just newly married. And what are we going to do? Is there a cure? Is there anything? What can he take? And there was nothing. There was no hope. There was nothing. The man behind the ice bucket. For a young guy like myself to be diagnosed. Rather than tearing them apart, Pete and Julie promised to spend the rest of their lives. Peter Freitas. <laughs> All of a sudden was like empowered. I was like, yeah, we are doing this in sickness and health, and I'm not. Pete, always the fighter, by this time in a wheelchair, stood up to walk his wife down the aisle. Is not covered. And these patients need someone watching them 24 hours a day. Is this kind of phase two or three or something of your campaign? It's now been nearly six years since Pete's diagnosis, but thanks to modern technology, with Julie by his side, he's already outlived the average life expectancy. What do you think of this disease? I hate it. It's an extremely cruel way for someone to live. You are literally trapped inside of your body. No one should have to live through that, especially someone who, you know, otherwise you thought he had his whole life ahead of him. Okay. Started. I was going to be thanking the patients who participated in our studies. So now I guess I'll turn it over to Brian. Just out of curiosity, the first patient that you described, how long did he live after his diagnosis? So he died about a year and a half after uh, that last video there. So uh, it would be about six and a half years. Any pathology of the brain? No, we did not have any uh, pathology on this patient. The second patient has uh, brain is up at Hopkins. Uh, his family donated his brain. Unfortunately, I, I really can't say. Uh, one thing, though, is that uh, for most patients who have ALS, it's the loss of uh, the ability to breathe, which is really related to their eventual death, and that uh, by staying on a ventilator, patients can be kept alive for a much longer period of time. Uh, but he, even before that, was sort of for ALS uh, at sort of the, uh, the long end of the bell curve in terms of survival. Okay, so uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Let me just uh, get this going here. Where is my... Um, okay, so um, can you hear me? Is this, can you hear me with this? Yep, okay. So um, what I want to really talk to you about today is uh, I think that Mary Kay has done a really good job explaining the clinical side of things. So I'm, I'm going to delve a little bit more into the science side of things and feel free to stop me at any stage and ask me questions, except anybody from my lab. You can't ask me questions, okay? I just want to state that up, uh, up front. All right, this is some of my uh, funding uh, sources. Um, if anybody wants to ask me about the Italian Football Federation or why they funded it at the end, it's a great story. So it's, uh, I'll tell you this. So some of this uh, has already been covered. So just very quickly, ALS was first described by this gentleman here, Jean-Marie Charcot, working in the Salpetriere Hospital in 1869. And in fact, as uh, Dr. Irwin uh, uh, said, in France, it's still known as Maladie du Charcot. 
But in the United States, the disease is more commonly known as Lou Gehrig's disease after the baseball player who died actually at a very young age. We always think of ALS as being one of these diseases that affects middle age and elderly. And actually, the individual that we actually named the disease after, he died very young of this uh, condition. And I've put up a, a few other images of other people who've succumbed to the disease over the years. Uh, the first, of course, is David Niven. Any hands up here. Who knows who David Niven is? Hands up. Keep your hands up. Now, everybody look around. And notice it's all the old people in the room <laughs> who know who David Niven is. Okay, and nobody in the young people know. So just for the young people in the room, David Niven was the George Clooney of his time. He was an English actor, very famous Hollywood English actor. He actually was the original James Bond in the original Casino Royale movie. And he died of ALS, and he's very close to the heart of a lot of us in the ALS community because he actually gave the money in his will to fund the very first ALS association, which is the English M&D Association. And in fact, they still are housed in the David Niven House in London. So very close to our heart. Other people who are alleged, now Mao Tse Tung is alleged to have died of ALS as well as some cardiac issues. Uh, we don't know for sure if that's the case, but it's interesting that he is. And then there's this gentleman here, Henry Wallace. Anybody know who Henry Wallace is? Yeah, <laughs> OK, you're excluded. Uh, do you know who Henry Wallace was? Yeah, he was, he was actually vice president. He was your 33rd vice president. And he was vice president to Roosevelt, to FDR. And he missed, and of course, FDR died, actually. Remember, the FDR died in office. And actually, he had just replaced um, uh, um, uh, Henry Wallace with Truman. And Truman became president. So he actually replaced Henry Wallace as the vice president 82 days before he died. So Henry Wallace actually missed out. He went on to die of ALS, and he missed out on being president of the United States by 82 days. Could you imagine how much funding we would have if a president of the United States for research into ALS, if a president had actually died of ALS? Now, I put this up here as a, as a little bit of sort of a, you know, to, to lighten the mood a little bit and to get a point across that actually we sometimes think of ALS as being a rare disease. But actually, it's much more common in the general population than we uh, appreciate. But to put some actual science on it, we, a very talented medical student working in our lab, did some calculations. And she worked out that actually over the next 25 years, by 2040, the number of cases of ALS around the world is going to rise to about 350,000 cases. And that actually represents an increase of about 69%. Now, we're not saying that that increase of 69% is due to an increase of the world population of 69%, because that would actually be a really massive increase. Actually, what it's due to is aging of the population, because we've got a lot, a whole bolus almost of people that are now in their 20s and 30s, and they're going to start hitting that middle age, which is the sort of risk factor, prime risk age for developing ALS. And I think that this is actually indicative for a lot of other neurodegenerative diseases that are out there. And I think that it's not just ALS where we're going to see a massive increase in the, in the number of cases, but also across the whole spectrum of neurodegeneration. Now, I should point out that that calculation of 350,000 cases is predicated on the idea that the average or median survival of ALS patients is about three years. That's what this chart here shows the survival graph showing the uh, uh, survival of ALS patients. Now, one of our jobs, and one of my jobs is, uh, when I go out and I talk to pharmaceutical companies, is I'm trying to get them to put their dollars and to invest their dollars into what seems like rare diseases, such as ALS. Because obviously, you know, that's what we want. We really want the big hitters like Merck and Pfizer to come in and start putting money into this. The one thing that the point that I make is, when I show them that slide is, look, if you come up with a drug that prolongs survival by one year, you're going to increase the number of patients that you can sell your drug to by one third within one year. You can see the dollar signs light up in their eyes when they realize that. And actually, I think that that's actually a very important thing, that really, if you think about it, if we're able to prolong the life of these patients, they're going to accumulate within the, within the population. We're going to see a lot more bigger population over time. And of course, Dealing and treating ALS patients is actually one of the most expensive diseases out there to deal with. 
So that's also something that's very important. Now, against that, um, I think it's fair to say that we, both the NIH and other institutions and other found, funding institutions, spend a lot of money on finding genes. I mean, it is an expensive business. And I think that it is a worthwhile time and sort of exercise, intellectual exercise, every so often to try and think, well, why do we want to find these genes? Why, why, what's the point behind it? So I roughly divide it into both clinical and scientific. So on the clinical side of things, I think that it's very important from the perspective of diagnosis of patients. So oftentimes when a patient comes to you, you actually kind of know what the, what the thing is. You listen to the history, you do the exam, and you kind of know what it is. But there are a, a fairly sizable chunk of patients, proportion of patients, where when they first come into you, you're not 100% sure what's going on. And if you actually knew what the genes were that caused that disease and you could test for them, that would give you some surety and some certainty as, yes, okay, I'm telling you that you have ALS and I know that you have C9 or 72 and therefore I'm pretty sure that you actually have ALS. Now, that's obviously very important for the patient to know because they really want a diagnosis. But also, I would imagine that if you fast forward 10 years from now, when we finally are starting to get treatments for neurodegeneration, hopefully before 10 years, hopefully five years, hopefully even next year. Um, but if you fast forward until the time when we actually have those treatments that are available, and I would imagine that the sooner you are able to start that treatment, the more effective it's going to be. Because no matter how good any treatment is, it ain't going to work on a dead neuron, right? So you really need to have preserved neurons. You really need to start your treatment as quickly as possible to actually have an effect. One of the things that diagnosis that genetics allows us to do and is really starting to come to the fore now with machine learning and with um, deep learning of, of the data and deep mining of the data is this idea of predictive diagnosis. And this is something that, you know, you kind of see it in Star Trek and you kind of see it in movies like Gattaca, but it's actually now becoming a reality. And I'll give you an example of this. This is a paper that was talent, uh, uh, published by a very talented uh, scientist working in our lab, data scientist. He likes to call himself a data scientist, uh, Mikey Knowles. Um, and he published this in Lancet Neurology. And what he did is he took clinical data and genetic data, and he worked out a model by which he will be able to diagnose patients and say, you have or you will have developed Parkinson's disease, not ALS, Parkinson's disease by such and such a date. And actually, he was able to do it with 92% accuracy and say, somebody sitting in front of them, they're completely normal. And you say to them, okay, based on this and based on a few other clinical findings, I can predict that within two years, you have a 92% chance of developing Parkinson's disease. And of course, the whole idea there is if we actually did have a treatment for Parkinson's disease, we could actually institute it and actually move forward with that. And now, and one of the other beauties of this idea of, of machine learning is that as we amass more and more data, those models are going to get better and better. And I know that Mikey is working on this and making it even uh, better than what it is. And I would say to all of the young people in the, in the audience who want to go forward to medical school or are already in medical school, this is going to transform how we do medicine. It really is going to change everything because we're going to be diagnosing people before they ever actually come uh, to, to disease. Genetic counseling. Most common question I get asked by my patients is, are my children going to get this? And of course, if you know the genes that cause the disease, yes, you can actually go and actually test for them if you want to do it. And then from the scientific perspective, if you know the gene, you can model it. It's a little bit difficult to build a mouse if you don't know what the gene is, right? right? But if you know the gene, you can actually do that. And the same thing actually applies to cellular models and actually giving you an insight into the pathogenesis. And then, of course, the final thing, and I think that this is the most important aspect of this, and, and it's almost like U.S. military speak. There, there's this thing in U.S. military that if you can see it, you can kill it, right? Well, same thing applies. With, me with medicine and with neurological diseases. If you can see it, if you know what the gene is, you can probably kill it. You can probably cure that particular di uh, disease. But unless you know what genes are underlying it, you're probably shooting a little bit in the dark just to uh, bring back, you know, um, uh, David Niven, another movie that David Niven was actually in. Okay, now I, I want to, the, a very important thing that I, I, I really want to get across here, and that is genetics is not the be all and end all. It is, in fact, 
the very first step. It is a very important first step. The first, most important step on the journey is, your, is the first one and the last one, right? But it is only just the beginning. There is a usually, typically, a 10-year journey from the discovery of the gene to the first in human clinical trials. And, to, and I should say 10 years plus a billion dollars. That, that's important, okay? That's actually quite important. But every so often you get lucky, all right? So this is a, an example of where we actually got extremely lucky. This is a, a disease, it's a form of motion neuron disease called brown violetto van Leer syndrome. It's actually ALS plus deafness and sometimes uh, plus, uh, plus blindness. And um, a number of studies that uh, were, came from our lab and from other labs around the world in patients with brown violetto van Leer syndrome found that those patients had mutations in two genes. And it turned out that those two genes were actually in the riboflavin pathway. So what's the riboflavin pathway? It ain't nothing except vitamin B2. So it turns out that we, if we replace and give high dose replacement vitamin B2 therapy to these patients, and that's been done in Queen Square at the moment by Henry Holden, who is one of the authors on these papers, it actually really works and it's ameliorated their disease. It's an amazing story. It's a very small percentage of patients, but it's really very, very important and powerful. Okay, so what am I gonna talk about today? Well, today I'm gonna to talk very briefly about exome sequencing. I'm going to spend a fair amount of time talking about C9ORF72, and then I'm going to talk about our most recent genome-wide association study, which uh, has just come out and we're a bit excited about. So just very briefly, exome sequencing um, is where you take, instead of sequencing one gene in the genome, you sequence all of the genes at the same time, all 20,000. represents about 1% of the human genome uh, that you're sequencing. And um, I think that this is a very good, so one of the real good things about working in the IRP, in the Intramural Research Program, is that we get our money up front, right? That's what we, that's the whole point behind it. We get our money. Now we have to justify ourselves four years later with our BSC, which mine is actually in two weeks from now, so we have to justify it. Um, uh, big stress and so forth. But you get your money up front. So what we don't have to do is we don't have to write a grant, which takes a couple of weeks, if not months, submit it, wait a few months until it's actually been rejected, <laughs> rewrite the grant, so another few weeks, another few months, submit it, wait for another few months to hear that you've been rejected again, and then maybe after the third time that you've actually submitted it, you get the money to actually do the study. So what does all that do? Well, it slows you down, right? It means that you can't bring your resources to bear. But in the intramural program, we have our money up front, so we can bring our resources to bear. And I think that it's a really good thing about them, uh, the IRP, that we're so nimble. So we were among the first to actually apply exome sequencing to neurodegeneration. And this was the study that actually came out as a consequence of it. We used exome sequencing in this Italian family that we had uh, been collected by a good friend and collaborator of mine in Italy, Adriano Chio. And it turned out that it was a mutation in a gene called VCP, or velocin-containing protein. Now, it was very cool from a technological perspective to do that. But actually, from a scientific perspective, it was also interesting. And the reason why I say that is VCP was a known gene, known cause of another condition called frontotemporal dementia. Now, let me say that if you see ALS and you see a patient with frontotemporal dementia in the clinic, you will not get those two confused. They are two totally different disparate neurological diseases. And yet, here we are with a gene that with mutations in the same gene causing both of those diseases. And it really sparked my interest on a, on a sort of a scientific basis on trying to understand and unravel the genetics that underlay it. And this kind of brings us on to C9ORF72. So C9ORF72, I, I'm Irish, um, as, as some people point as Many people can tell from my accent, I'm Irish. But uh, uh, in case you don't know, Irish people love telling stories. So, you know, there's a long tradition. So I'm going to tell you a story about the C9R72 locus. And it really starts back in 2006 with the publication of two papers, uh, both of which were based on traditional old-fashioned, sorry, I hate that term, I get into trouble when I call linkage old-fashioned, but still, old-fashioned linkage studies. And they identified a locus on the short arm of chromosome nine. 
And those two studies, together with a couple of other studies that came out at about the same time, identified a region of about 7.2 million base pairs that we knew was linked in to patients with both ALS and with frontotemporal dementia. Now, just to put that in perspective, there are 3 billion base pairs in the human genome. If you want to genome sequence them, you have to sequence both moms and dads. So that's 6 billion base pairs. So there's about 6 billion individuals alive in the world at the present time. So 7 million base pairs is about the size of the city of London. That's what we were looking at. Now, in genetics terms, not that big. We could actually, with 130 genes in there, we could actually work our way through it. That's, it's doable. The problem was that all of these different laboratories around the world were trying to figure out what the underlying mutation is. Because knowing where the, the mutation is is kind of interesting, but what you really want to know is what is the gene effect and what is the actual underlying mutation. Nobody was having any luck with respect to that. So it was really sort of taking on this aura of a holy grail uh, in, in the ALS and the FDD community. So our involvement in the hunt started with this genome-wide association study of ALS that we did in Finland. It's actually only done, and you'll remember these numbers for later on when I'm talking about our GWAS, only done on 300 cases and 300 controls, which is like staggeringly small. And yet, this was the first genome-wide association study where we really saw really robust signals. We saw a signal right there on the short arm of chromosome 9 right in the middle of where that other locus was. And lo and behold, because of the dense nature of the SNPs on those chips that we use for the GWAS, we were able to narrow it from 7 million base pairs down to just 230,000 base pairs, which in genetics terms is nothing. It's a blink of an eye. It contained three genes. I made my poor grad student at the time, Jennifer Shimmick, stay in the lab for two weeks solo without going home sequencing those two genes, because I really thought that we'd have it within the next couple of days. Next time. When I rang her four years later, she had moved on to, 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 to medical school, and, and to remind her that, you know, to tell her, tell her that we'd actually found it, she reminded me about the time that I made her actually stay, and that was the first thing that she, she reminded me of. So anyway, we tried, we realized from an early stage that this was going to be a difficult nut to crack. So what we said, okay, look, we're the NIH. We do things differently. We're supposed to do things differently. That's why they give us the money up front, right? So we said, okay, well, instead of competing with people, we reached out to different groups around the world, in Manchester, in London, in Amsterdam, in Helsinki, and in, um, crucially in Cardiff. Uh, and we said, look, in many cases, these guys were direct competitors of ours. And we said, look, let's work together and try and find this. We have the resources here. You send us the DNA samples that you've collected. We run them on the machine, and then we push all of the data out, and we analyze it together. And then we teamed up with another consortium run by Rosa Rademacher, who's working down at the Mayo Clinic in Florida. And from an early stage, we focus on this particular family here, which we call the Gwent-1 kindred. And it was collected by this marvelous neurologist here in, uh, uh, shown here, uh, Hugh Morris. And Hugh Morris spent 10 years in Cardiff, getting in his car, this is a small little town just south of Cardiff. And every weekend, he'd get in his car and he'd drive down and he'd meet with the family and he'd collect samples and he'd uh, phenotype them. And I think it is very important if to anybody here who wants to go to medical school that really collecting those samples is crucial to uh, the success of, of genetics. But anyway, he collected this family and it became really sort of our core family for doing it. And we tried everything on this family. Any technique that you can think of, we tried it, okay? and nothing was showing up. Now, that was not wasted effort because it told us that it was going to be either one of two types of mutations. It was either an insert of a new piece of DNA that we knew nothing about, or else the entire region was flipped. And we knew that that kind of flip could occur in neurological disease, specifically frontotemporal dementia with the map tau locus. So what we did and what finally gave it to us is we sent cell lines for the, the, one of the samples, I think it was this one down here, the ProBand. We sent it off to a commercial company in Germany. And they flow sorted out chromosome 9 and sent us back DNA that was enriched for chromosome 9. The reason why that was important, because in those days, next generation sequencing was still really expensive. So what we did is we just kept putting this enriched DNA and generating more and more and more data. 
We actually have a technical term for that. We sequence the snot out of it. We just kept putting it on flow cell after flow cell. And eventually we analyzed it in a variety of ways. It turns out it wasn't an inversion. But what finally gave it to us was I looked in that area and I said, okay, which polymorphisms have never been described before? Which changes have never been described as human population polymorphisms? And in the total area of 230,000 base pairs, there was only eight. And six of them were all within 30 base pairs of each other. I went, okay, that's a bit unusual. So I went in and I took a look at it. And this is actually a screenshot from what I saw that day. And each of those bars represents an actual read. The way next generation sequence works is it's a read. And actually it's 300 deep. It actually will go, if you were to dig into the basement, that's how far down it goes. It's actually truncated. So what you see is a 300 base pair. Every base pair is sequenced about 300 times, goes down to two, and then back up to 300 or 400 X. And that's a pattern that we tend to see whenever there is a problem with the underlying structure of the DNA. That was the first thing I noticed. Second thing I noticed was, see those two lonely reeds up there? The ones in the center? Well, it turns out, remember how this works. We're generating literally trillions of reeds. I'm not kidding you, that, with a T of reeds. And they have to be aligned by a computer algorithm back to the reference human genome. But every so often, the algorithm gets it wrong. So what we did, we got our pencil and paper, and we realigned those two reads manually. And it turned out that what it showed us was that individual carried more of this GGGGCCC motif than was indicated in the reference human genome. The reference human genome said, these guys should only have three. And we were seeing that there was many more, and it was actually truncated. So what it turned out to be was an insert of a new piece of DNA, in this case, a repeat expansion consisting of these GGCCCs right here, right at the start of that gene C9 or 72. And it turned out there was an absolutely massive one. Now, of course, that was a very expensive thing. We couldn't do that for every single sample, so we designed another assay to look at it. We also did fish fluorescent in situ hybridization against it using a probe against the repeat. And you can just see on chromosome nine lighting up there. And I love the fact that this is actually a technology that came into existence about 100 years ago. Fluorescence, uh, not quite the fluorescence, but the inside your hybridization. And we were using both this really old technology and this really new technology together. So uh, this ended up being published back to back with Rosa Rademacher's group, who actually found the same gene using a different technique uh, in Neuron in 2010, uh, sorry, 2011. And it's fair to say that it's actually been a real watershed moment um, in the ALS research community. Um, it's really sort of sparked this almost mini industry um, surrounding this. And there's several reasons for this. First and foremost, it was the first time that a repeat expansion, a large repeat expansion, had been shown to be causative in a common neurological disease like ALS. Secondly, it was incredibly common. It caused about 40% of familial ALS in, in, in um, uh, Caucasian cases. It also caused about 8% of sporadic disease ALS. And that was really, that was really a, a marvelous thing for me. I, I, I should say that you know, I had spent years going to funding organi organizations and charitable organizations going, look, I'm telling you, sporadic ALS is genetic. Give us money and we'll show you. And we were like taking millions of dollars and trying to find this, that showed that this was genetic without much success. And many other groups were doing exactly the same. And finally, we had come along with this C9 or 72 repeat expansion and shown that a significant chunk of sporadic disease was actually due to this particular, uh, due to genetics. The other reason is, actually, it causes about the same proportion of disease in FTD, about 40% of familial FTD and about 8% of, of sporadic FTD were also good. So we actually have a gene that unites these two very disparate neurodegenerative diseases together. Um, now, I, I will say that, uh, I actually, well, you, you know, it was pretty amazing to be sitting in front of the computer and actually seeing what the result of that was and, and to be, you know, to really know what this gene that everybody had been spending years looking for. I think there's really only one other thing that could be comparable to that, 
And that would be knowing who really won Florida in the 2000 presidential election. Was it Bush or was it Gore? So, so you know, and I say that, you know, it's a real eureka moment. And I say that for the, for the graduate students and the, and the fellows in the, in the audience, because, you know, it's really sometimes very exciting in, in, in genetics. But I don't want to mislead you because we don't find a new gene every single day of the week, right? It, it's sometimes, it's an unusual thing. Um, and, and I, but there is other things that you can do in genetics. And I think that this graph here kind of shows you, it shows you one of those things. It's almost like a time machine, almost. Um, so when we discovered that peak, that association signal in ALS in the Finnish population, we found that all of those cases had a particular haplotype or arrangement of SNPs across the, across the locus. So we, once we actually found the repeat expansion, of course, at that time, we didn't know what the, what the underlying mutation was. But once we found it, we said, well, look, I wonder if all the other cases that are carrying this repeat expansion also are carrying the same haplotype and the same Finnish haplotype. And that's what this particular graph is showing here. This actually represents about 240 cases. All of the blue ones are actually Finnish cases. The orange are Americans, the red are Italians. And at the top is that lonely Japanese individual sample that we actually found the C9 or 72 in. And basically the length of the line tells you how much of, that, of the haplotype, of the Finnish haplotype did they actually carry? So this individual carries it from here to here. This individual carries the haplotype from here to here. And this is the actual location of the, of the, of the repeat expansion. And virtually every single case that we found the expansion in also carried the same haplotype. Now, there are many ways to interpret it. But the way I've chosen to interpret it, because being an Irishman, I love telling stories. Um, the way I've chosen to interpret it is, that probably what happened was this event happened once in human history. And it happened by our guess, by our estimates, about the time of the fall of the Roman Empire, about 1,500 years ago. And it happened in Scandinavia. So the question is, well, wait a minute. It happened in Scandinavia. Scandinavia is pretty sort of isolated. How did it end up all around the rest of the world? Well, we think that these guys, on their summer vacations, brought it with them when they were traveling all around Europe on the medieval. And, and it's actually really quite interesting. Oh, by the way, if there's any Finnish people in the, in the audience, yes, I know that the Finnish were not the Vikings. OK, I know that. It's OK. I'm talking Scandinavia in general. Turns out that if you actually look of a map of where the Vikings conquered in the Middle Ages, it matches really well where we currently, in modern day world, find where C9 or 72 is. It's really quite striking. Uh, so it's quite, quite interesting. And like I said, almost like a time machine. Now, I will say up front, I said it at the beginning, I'll say it at the end. Not everybody agrees with me with respect to that. And there's a possibility that it's not true. But you know, it's kind of an interesting story. So, so let's end here a little bit uh, quickly. I've got about 10 minutes left. Uh, Genome-wide association study that we just recently published um, um, on ALS. And this involved, remember, the Finnish GWAS was 300 cases and 300 controls, right? And that was because it's a conserved population. That's why it was so effective there. But it turns out that now we're up to 20,000 cases and 60,000 controls. And you can see that we find several loci. A lot of them were known loci, including C9 or 72. But there was one new locus right there on chromosome. It's shown in black. And it's on the, the, the long arm of chromosome 12. And it's in the region of the KIF5A gene. And the reason why we know it's the KIF5 gene uh, for, for sure is because John Landers, who is, works at the University of Massachusetts, he was working on ALS at the same time. We got these results about the middle of 2017. And then John sort of, we, we, we kind of bumped into each other at a conference. And he actually had found exactly the same gene using, in this case, gene burden analysis based on exome sequencing. What that told us was that really this was a robust finding, all right, because we were finding it in two different ways. And it kind of was reminiscent almost of other gene uh, stories like LERC2 and C9, where multiple individuals are coming, in, uh, coming uh, together on the same gene at the same time. Uh, am I OK? I've got another few minutes. Is that OK? Thank you. All right. So 
we were really sort of um, happy with that. And, and so it turns out that the Kinesin family member 5A or KIF 5A is part of our subunit of Kinesin 1. And Kinesin 1 is the protein complex that's responsible for anti-grade axonal transport. And this video shows very nicely the Kinesin 1 complex walking down the microtubule of the axon, dragging the vesicle, the cargo vesicle behind it. And it turns out that all of the mutations that we found in ALF were all up here in the cargo binding domain of the protein, which is kind of really cool. Um, what this study was notable for was the fact that it involved, just co after coming out in Neuron, Ode, who's sitting in the audience, is the uh, first author on this uh, uh, particular uh, paper. She did a great job doing the analysis. And it involved 125,000 samples. That's a lot of samples, right? And it would only be possible through the collaboration of major genetics groups. And I think that that's a, a thing that we see permeating through the genetics field. That really, we're into this collaborative spirit nowadays. And, and, and gone are the days of the scientists working late at nighttime on his own in the lab. And the other thing is that we were able to go straight from the GWAS hit to the gene. Now, I've just a, a few minutes left. And I'm going to talk. This is the timeline of ALS genetics. It all started in 1993 with Bob Brown, who was my, one of my mentors, finding the SOD1 gene uh, as a cause of familial ALS. But then there was a long, 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 long hiatus until the discovery of TDP43 in 2006, and then, of course, C9R72 in 2011. Today, fast forward to today, and I think it's fair to say that we know about two-thirds of the cause of familial ALS and about 15% of the cause of sporadic disease. Now, I'll, honestly, I'm not terribly concerned about the familial side of things because I think that we're going to grind that out slowly over the next few years and we've got programs going on. What keeps me awake and wor worried at nighttime is how are we going to narrow this gap here, the, the sporadic disease? And that's going to be a much more difficult nut to crack, I think. Um, of course, we're not just interested in finding genes for the sake of finding genes. We also want to try to put them together on pathways. And I think this is a lovely illustration actually done by uh, Ruth Chia, who's a, uh, a soon to be a staff scientist in, and, and, uh, in our lab. And she's done a really good job showing that not only have we genes and putting them on the, on the, on the, um, um, the various chromosomes, but also we're able to identify the pathways that those genes lie on. And that would include RNA metabolism, autophagy, and cytoskeletal. And I don't know what happened there, but it seemed to have gone, let me just go back for a sec. OK, so very nice sort of graph there showing the different pathways that are coming out. And I'll end with this slide saying, look, these are group efforts. There's a lot of people involved in all of these, and you see some pictures of them here. And, and it really is important to try and work together, especially when we're talking about a rare disease like ALS. So I'll, I'll pause there and, and uh, catch my breath. And um, if there are any questions, I'm happy to take them. Yes. So what is the definition of this chromosome 9 ORS 72? What do you mean? What's, I, I don't understand the question. How do you define uh, 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 uh. Oh. How do, well, it's a gene. It's a known gene. Is that what you're talking about? Yes. C9. Or ORF72. OK, so C9 means chromosome 9. Yes. ORF stands for open reading frame. Yes. And then 72, because it was the 72nd open reading frame that was found on chromosome, on chromosome 9. So let me explain a little bit here of, of history here. OK, so it turns out that whenever a gene is found, until it, is, until it is figured out what that gene does, it has an ORF designation. So C21ORF2, for example, C9ORF72. And it follows that pattern, chromosome ORF and the, num and the number along the chromosome. Um, the vast, vast majority of genes nowadays when you actually, if you find them, you can go in and you can look at the domains of those proteins, and that tells you what the protein does, right? C9R72 is one of those things. We went in and we went, okay, well, what does it do? There is no information, right? That was in 2011. There are 2,500 papers 
on C9 or 72. And nobody still knows what the protein does. It's all about the, 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 the repeat expansion. There has been some thought that it might be a den protein. And in fact, there was a move to, to actually try and change the name of it by Hugo. Um, but when they reached out to the ALS and FTD community, I think they more or less said, okay, we've got 2,500 publications on this. It was all calling it C9ORF72. It will always be called C9ORF72, so don't change the name of it. Um, so it, there, there's a little bit of a history, uh, history to it, so we'll see. If they do change it, I'm still I'm going to use the PRINCE moniker. I'm going to call it the gene formerly known as C9ORF72. Okay. Is it familial or coronary? It's both. It's both. Although, if you believe me, I think that all of those sporadic disease cases are actually really, truly familial cases. And that what we're seeing here is that the border, you know, as clinicians, we use this definition of familial and sporadic, but in reality, and it's quite useful when we're talking to patients, but in reality, that border is much more porous than we think. So. Yes. Oh, yes, my. <laughs> you had, say, eight different uh, pathways in which the various discovered genes are, are thought to be functionally yep. important. Uh, what is the convergence of those on a single pathological mechanism? Um, okay, that is an absolutely excellent question. Uh, you know, I wish I could have used the microphone like that. It's kind of like a rock star. Yeah. 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 Um, uh, that is an absolute excellent question. I think it refers back to exactly what Mary Kay uh, said at the very beginning, and that is, we used to think of ALS as a monolithic disease. Now we know that it is not one disease. It is a group of diseases, all affecting motor neurons to one extent or another, but it does appear to be different diseases. So we're not looking for one particular pathway, we're looking for a group of pathways. And we can put them into, we can divide the ALS into the cytoskeletal and divide them into the, into the RNA metabolism side of things. So it's not really that we're looking for one, I think we're looking for uh, a smaller number. So I have a couple of questions. Sure. Your finding may help uh, clarify why that may be the case? Okay, so the short answer is no. The long answer is so is it, that, that it, it's not without its controversy, that, that idea that it, it, it spreads. I think that it's clear that there's a certain element of spread, but how much is going on, we do not know. And, and if I had half an hour and a couple of sheets of paper, I could probably explain that in more detail. But uh, I, I think that we are all struggling to get clarity on that. What worries me about all of this, and, and you referred to John Ravitt's uh, work, what worries me about this is that when we do an autopsy, what's an autopsy? End stage, right? What's going on over there when they started the disease? And how much does the autopsy reflect what was happening at the beginning? And, and I think that that is actually a problem that faces the entire field, not just in ALS. I think it, it, it faces, I mean, I think that Alzheimer's may be a little bit better off because they've got PET ligands now that can actually follow those things. Um, I wish, I dream for the days when we actually have a TDP43 ligand. That, I think, is going to answer a lot of questions. And maybe it will turn out that it's this spread that's going on. Uh, but I'm just, I'm not 100% sold on that idea just quite yet. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, what's the uh, relationship to superoxide? So has this led to any meaningful therapy in an attempt to track free radicals? Yeah. Yeah, no, I think that's an excellent question. There have been many attempts to do things like that. And on the biochemical side of things, I don't think that, I think it's fair to say that they have not been terribly successful. However, there is a lot of excitement in the field, and I'll tell you why. 
because it turns out that um, a company that talking about changing names, they're now known as Ionis Pharmaceuticals. They're previously known as ISIS, and in my mind, they will always be known as ISIS. And, and they, changed. I, I, they changed it because of a Saturday Night Live sketch, would you believe? It was, it was actually quite, they changed it on the Monday after the, after the Saturday Night sketch. So it turns out that they have developed antisense oligotherapy against SOD1 and also against C9 or 72. And there's a lot of excitement in the field that those particular forms of gene therapy might be successful. Um, so stay tuned. Uh, maybe over the next one to two to three years, we may actually have a pretty good success story with respect to that. But in terms of small molecules, right? So this is trapper, yeah. No, no, none of that. I think that. I think it's fair to say that Rilizol has an effect. I think it's fair to say that New Dexta certainly has an effect on symptoms and hopefully also has an effect maybe on uh, the ratio progression. I think there's another drug out there called a Daravone. Uh, but maybe, maybe Mary, I'm hugging the, hugging the microphone a little bit. Maybe you want to comment on that. Well, you know, I actually had to put in a second slide and then the third I had actually put in a second slide set in case Brian went short, uh, which starts out with 20 years of uh, treatment trials in ALS. Why have we not had any success? And um, it's it's really the case that uh, really all of the treatments that were initially brought up with the idea of excitotoxicity, uh, at, uh, uh, looking at oxidative stress, uh, and uh, other sorts of uh, growth factors on the muscle really have not at all changed the course of the disease. And so in terms of small molecules, they are actually uh, people working on small molecules to interact with um, the uh, abnormal accu accumulations of RNA to prevent uh, some of the uh, yeah. effects which the RNA uh, uh, accumulations in C9 ORF are thought to be uh, potentially toxic. So. Um, I was aware that they caused, uh, they also caused some form of um, uh, pediatric neurological disease yeah, as well. Right. Okay, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it's so. not a neurological disease, to my knowledge. It's more metabolic. That's interesting, yeah. isn't it? That's interesting. Yeah. Hmm. So to return to this, um, these mutations cause two very distinct diseases. Can you explain what you think the mechanism is that a, a gene can cause two extremely distinct diseases? Mm -hmm. Okay, short answer, no. <laughs> I wish I could. Now, the longer answer is that I think that that is a burning question within the field. Um, and I think that there are two approaches that have been adopted largely within the field to try and answer that. Number one is picking out candidate genes and trying to say, well, look, we think this candidate gene is more so if you've got variants in there, it pushes you towards ALS, and if you don't have variants, it pushes you towards uh, FTD. And certainly, uh, there's a gene called TREM106B that seems to, uh, um, uh, some preliminary data on candidate gene study data to suggest that. The other aspect, and the way we try and approach this is we try to avoid candidate gene studies. We try and do sort of uh, omic-wide studies looking for genes that influence either age of onset or the, or the disease. We've got, and Ode has been actually uh, pioneering some of this work, we have some interesting hits that are suggestive but do not reach as of yet, at least with our numbers, genome-wide significance. Um, but I, 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 the, not only is it interesting from a scientific perspective, it's actually crucially important from a gene, uh, from a therapeutic perspective. Because if you could identify a gene that influences the age of onset or something that delays the age of onset, and you could then hit it with a small molecule, as, as Wynn is suggesting, that's a big deal. And I think that that is something, you know, we're all very eager for that. And, and certainly when I talk to pharmaceutical companies and, and individuals, very clever scientists working within those industries, that's what they're interested in. That's what they really want to know.
including the need to identify people who systematically support human rights in their country. Yeah, I, and I think that's part of the um, interest in uh, identifying genetic causes of disease. And then the, um, the question will be for something, for example, the antisense, where it may have to be given repeatedly, at what is the correct time point? And um, there are some markers, biomarkers in CSF that have been uh, shown to be present once people become symptomatic, uh, but not in pre-symptomatic, whereas other ones are present throughout uh, the course of the disease. But the, uh, there was this conference two years ago uh, looking at why the 20 years of failure and other things that have to be considered are um, the fact that maybe we have had the wrong design, which would include patients too late in the disease, uh, that we don't really have good um, markers for whether the treatments ever engage the target, and that really is something that has to be worked on. And then also the issue about animal models, because it's very difficult to have a animal model that uh, really completely recapitulates the disease. Can I ask whether the Nicolas study may include asymptomatic family members? Uh, no, you screen those out. So what you want to do is you want a collection on one side of cases, absolute diagnose, they are, they are, and you don't want them related to each other because if they're related, it actually inflates up the, the, the score. And then on the other side, as the comparison, you want the co a cohort of controls who you know don't have disease. Now, to be fair, you know that a certain, if you've got 100,000 controls, you know that there's going to be a proportion of those who actually would go on to develop ALS. But GWAS is so robust that it allows you to overcome that. And, that, and it, it kind of gets built into the model. Well, before we know whether she As well. Yeah. So at what point do you then study the family members who are asymptomatic? Sure, and, and I, I think that you know that was one of the things that Mary Kay was was uh, very careful to include in the C9 or 72 clinic. Uh, so we have at what at this stage about five to ten individuals who actually carry the C9 gene, uh, and fifteen. Well, uh, so five plus ten, uh, fifteen, uh, and they have not yet developed disease. Hopefully, they never will. But we've collected biospecimens from them that we will sort of, we hope, be a building block towards development of some sort of biomarker that will predict if they're going to go on to disease or when they're going to go on to disease. Are you planning to do like a GWAS study? So, uh, not re well, not really at the moment. No, I, I can't say, I can't see a good use for them per se. They're, they, they get included in certain aspects of what we do, but not. I wouldn't do it just on them alone. I'd always include in ALS cases as well on top of that. Does that make sense? Maybe I can explain to you later. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Is there any PET or MRI imaging that could localize? And what is the sensitivity and specificity of those imaging for ALS? of PET studies, the only thing that has been done uh, is looking at FTG uptake, which may be less in the frontal lobes, but that's very, very nonspecific. I think you see that in other dementia disorders. There's no PET ligand for something like TDP43 that would allow us to localize. In terms of MRI, that's an area that uh, we've been working on for um, the last four or five years now. Um, it does seem that um, there are a number of changes that happen in the brains, and when we start to parse them out in terms of gray matter changes and atrophy, uh, it does seem that there are much more gray matter changes in patients who have the dementing uh, characteristics. Uh, when we look at the white matter tracts, it's very interesting that um, the changes in the corticospinal yeah. tract and the middle portion of the corpus callosum seem to correlate very well with the ALS functional rating score whereas changes in more anterior portions of the um, corpus callosum 
and the uh, uncinate fasciculus seem to correlate better with the cognitive changes. So these are not at a point where we can talk about sensitivity and specificity. We're still at the point of discovering them and uh, discovering them by comparing patients to uh, healthy controls. Since the disease progressed from brain all the way to the spinal cord, could you also see the pathology along the spinal cord beside the brain? It, it doesn't necessarily progress that way, uh, but there is a lot of interest in looking at the spinal cord. You know, from a point of view of MRI, uh, it's very, uh, you have much less, um, uh, of, uh, it's very difficult to get good high resolution spinal cord images. Uh, you know, so the magnet uh, receiver coils are actually on the outside of the body and the spinal cord is about uh, this large. But there are some people who are starting to show some changes but again, it's still um, fairly much in the range of discovery of uh, diffusion tensor changes in the um, corticospinal tracts in the cervical cord, for example. Congratulations for pioneering work. More power to you. Okay. okay.